Hello, my name is David Ades. I'm a poet based in Sydney and the host of a monthly poetry podcast reading series, which you're watching, called Poets Corner, in association with West Words in Parramatta in Sydney's West. West Words is Western Sydney's literature development organisation. Poets Corner is part of West Words public programming that celebrates the richness, diversity and insight that literature offers. Especially in these times, we thank the ongoing support of Create New South Wales, the Cultural Fund of Copyright Australia, City of Parramatta Council, Blacktown City Council and Campbelltown City Council, as well as the many project partners that have enabled us to continue to provide opportunities to writers and audiences. We hope that this new world will see a sharing and a closeness of spirit. So each month, I invite a poet to read poems and talk about them for an hour or two <laughs> around a theme of the poet's choice. Our guest poet today is Stuart Barnes, who will read and talk about poems from his latest book, Like to the Lark, on the theme of form and function. But first, an acknowledgement of country. I'm recording this from Beecroft in Sydney. Stuart is recording from central Queensland. I would like to pay my respects to and acknowledge the elders, past, present, and emerging of the Wellamita people, the traditional custodians of the land in Beecroft, and also of the Durrambal people, the traditional custodians of the land where Stuart resides, and to acknowledge also that they are the sovereign owners of their land, which has never been ceded or given up. Stuart Barnes is a Tasmanian-born, Queensland-based Australian poet. He's the author of Light to the Lark with Upswell Publishing, 2023, and Glass Houses through University of Queensland Press 2016, which won the 2015 Arts Queensland Thomas Shapcock Prize, was commended for the 2016 Anne Elder Award, and shortlisted for the 2017 Mary Gilmore Award. Stewart's poems have appeared on GOA, Brisbane's broadcast roadside digital billboard network, been commissioned for Alcatraz, Australian Poetry Journal, Dancing About Architecture and Other Ekphrastic Maneuvers, Memory Book, Portraits of Older Australians in Poetry, and watercolours and Peril magazine, as well as Red Room Company, Poetry Objects 2019 and Poetry Month 2023, and been widely published in anthologies and journals, including in Admissions, Voices Within Mental Health, The Anthology of Australian Prose Poetry, Best of Australian, po uh, Australian Poems 2022, Going Postal, More Than Yes or No, The Montreal Poetry Prize Anthology 2020, the Language in My Tongue, an anthology of Australian and New Zealand prose poetry, The Moth, Poetry Chicago, and Poetry Wales. Other poems have been awarded the Gwen Harwood Poetry Prize, nominated for the Pushcart Prize, and shortlisted for the ACU Prize for Poetry, the Arts Queensland Val Vallis Award, the Montreal International Poetry Prize, the Newcastle Poetry Prize, and the Venny Holmgren Environmental Poetry Prize. Stewart has performed his poetry at Brisbane Writers' Festival, Perth Festival Writers Week and Queensland Poetry Festival. From 2013 to 2017, he was poetry editor of Tincture Journal. Since then, he has guest co-edited issues of Australian Poetry Journal, Cordite Poetry Review and Rabbit, a journal for nonfiction poetry, and co-judged the Arts Queensland Thomas Shapcock Prize and the Arts Queensland Val Vallis Award. In 2023, Stuart's poem Offworld Gazelle, which we will be reading, uh, was set to music by award-winning Australian writer Nigel Featherstone and released by Hell Herons, an Australian spoken word music collective. Uh, Stuart's Twitter handle is at Stuart A. Barnes. His website is at www.stuartabarnes.com. And after all that, hi, Stuart, and welcome to Poets Corner. Hi, David. Thanks for having me on. My pleasure. Always a, always a pleasure. Uh, so you've chosen form and function as your theme. And you're going to take us on a cook's tour of forms by reading nine poems in nine different forms from, from like to the lark. Um, and we'll, we'll get a chance to chat about the form of each of those poems when we get to them. But I, I wanted to start with some general questions first. Sure. Um, and the first one is, what do you mean by function? Hmm, by function, um, <clears throat> uh, uh, what's the purpose of the poem? How does uh, that particular poem's form speak to um, other poems over history written in the same form? Uh, how might it speak to future poems? Um, what might it 
what might that form say to other people? Um, so I suppose I'm I'm always thinking about uh, a broader conversation, poem to poem, poem to person, poem to history, mm. poem to the world. Mm. So uh, it's not it's not really, function is not really a separate aspect um, to your poems. It's 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 integrally related to form. It is yes, um, and the more I've the more I write in form and the more I think about form and function, the more I realise just how connected they are and how connected, at least for me, they always have been uh, for, some, for some personal reasons that I'm happy to go into and for some, uh, some, for some poetic reasons also. Mm. I mean, is it the aesthetic of form that appeals to you? That's one of the things. Um, I think forms are, I think they're very beautiful. Um, I think they look beautiful. Um, it's also what, what can be done with the form as well. Um, some poets have spoken about breaking form. Others have spoken about bending form. Uh, so I'm interested in doing both. And I'm interested in, there's a phrase by American writer Sandra Beasley. Uh, it's actually the title of an essay she wrote on the Sestina, or part of the title. It's called Flexing the Form. Mm. And that, that phrase resonates, resonates most strongly uh, for me. Uh, this this concept of how far the idea of how far a, a poetic form can be pushed mm. um, does a sonnet have to be about love? No, it doesn't. Um, does a guzzle have to be about loss or or the the pain of loss in love? No, it doesn't. Um, so I love exploring what. And this is again where function comes in. Uh, I love exploring um, the possibilities of of form. I think most poets most poets dabble with or or play with form to some extent. Um, I think I've done it myself. But you seem to have a very very strong commitment to form, and and I was interested um, because it's it's not something you see a lot, particularly in younger poets. What what drew you initially to writing in form? I remember this very clearly. Um, it's probably around 2008 or 2009, I actually read an interview with uh, Anne Sexton and her, her psychiatrist suggested she write sonnets uh, as a way of... Um, as a way to heal mentally um, from depression. Mm. And I was depressed at the time and I thought, mm, I wonder whether that, that might help. And it did. So for about a year and a half, I wrote a lot of really terrible sonnets. <laughs> but it, 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 sparked a, a, uh, it sparked a love of form as a writer whereas my love of form as a reader goes back to uh, to sort of middle slash high school and then university. Uh, there was always something about the the uh, those fixed forms, sonnet, pantoon, guzzle, sestina, their form on the page that really appealed also. Um, I mentioned something, you know, something... Uh, personal before I've been thinking about this a lot too I have uh, obsessive compulsive disorder and for me the blank page is absolutely terrifying mm. and I, uh, I actually really need the the scaffolding of yeah. that form provides um, yeah. otherwise I find it extremely difficult to actually start writing and start to think and then overthink Whereas if I have a form there with some fixed end words in a sestina or a tritina, then 
I find a, a poem can come to me quite well sometimes quite easily other other times uh, not so easily um so yeah this is actually something that I've only sort of realized in the last couple of weeks that as well as the aesthetics of of uh of forms uh there's 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 a there's a sort of deep personal um uh attachment slash need uh for these forms also but were you were you writing before the Anne Sexton interview were you writing poetry and and was it not in form I was I was I've sort of been writing poetry on and off since I was a mm, early teenager a young mm -hmm. teenager um yeah I, I mean and I, I remember writing always been strongly connected to had a strong connection to music and song and I remember writing songs and little sort of books of I wouldn't really call it poetry but um just throwing a couple of words together and making books when I was a kid so mm. writing something that's always been there and it um it took me a long time to actually uh even though I really loved it and I loved uh uh, the sensations uh, when I write, it took me a long time to actually take take writing uh, very seriously. Mm. Well, yeah. In my case, it's like I, I wasn't going to give myself permission to call myself a poet because I had the dream. And if I failed, then I wouldn't have the dream anymore. So I just didn't do it for many years. <laughs> Silly me. Um, Likewise. But, but, yeah. So. Yes. But, this is interesting so in a way it was like form was your way of entering into becoming a poet is that a fair comment I think so yes um just thinking about that period now I, I think it was I um yes yes um writing sonnets and then experimenting with sonnets so um taking lines from one sonnet so sort of creating sonnet sequences where you know a line from the middle of the previous sonnet would be would appear or appear in a slightly remixed form in the next poem in the sequence and you know that's when I realized that uh form had possibility beyond what it was created for which is mm quite obvious really but <laughs> you know uh at, at the time it wasn't uh so it was it was um it was demanding yet it was also it became it was and it was fun and it was a lot of hard work um it felt like hard work and but then when I then when I discovered <laughs> discovered that I could muck around with form then it became really fun mm. and, uh, I, I know for a lot of poets form um, uh, uh, poets have said they feel like writing in form is uh, they feel as if they're being sort of strangled and but for me writing in form is it's really liberating yeah I was going to talk to you about that a bit later on because I mean fun is this book is so much fun there's so much fun in this book oh thank um, you regardless of you know the seriousness of some of the subject matter mm. Um, mm. but um so I, I was just wondering just sort of going further with the thought is writing in form a bit like trying to solve a puzzle like you set yourself a puzzle it's not a rubik's cube exactly but you set yourself a puzzle and and then you you massage it into some kind of response to solve it, it that's that's actually yes that's actually how i've always thought of of poetic form that that it's a puzzle a riddle uh to be solved and um unfortunately or fortunately I have to walk away from some poems and some may never be solved some of those puzzles may never be solved oh, yeah. and that's Cooey okay darlings. Cooey darlings. <laughs> I've, yes that's right and you know it, it is it is a you know there is a learning curve there that it's that it's okay that some of those 
forms and ever resolved. But just recently, I've come back to some poems that I started a few years ago, and they they just weren't ready to they weren't ready to be written a few years ago. Mm. I was able to finish a couple of them recently. Um, so so yes, I, I have always thought of them as puzzles, as sort of um, sort of cryptic crosswords. Yeah, 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 yeah. And- but do you do you now write in free form at all, or is every poem does every poem have a formal element? Probably the yes, probably the closest I get to free form would be prose poetry, um, which is something that I avoided for a very long time. Uh, again, because there's no fixed form there, but my prose poems have to have. Um, certain constraints. Um, they have to look a certain way on the page. Um, I, I love a perfect rectangle of text. There you go. <laughs> and if it, if a, if a poem, if if it if it won't come out as a perfect rectangle of text, then I'll make it <laughs> a perfect rectangle of text. Uh, so, yeah, I, you know, I'm also aware that you know um, that. Free verse is a form in itself. So that's right. It does have it, you know it, it, everything we write uh, is is a form. Um, yeah. yeah. Um, you mentioned how some poets feel like strangled in form, and I, I was going to talk about that because it's a bit of a paradox, and certainly certainly a tension. Uh, formal poems are said to embody uh, both constraint and the liberation that you've talked about. Um, mm. So I've, you, you talked about a kind of scaffolding. I, I, I was the same. I visualized form as the external architecture of a poem within which there's a huge amount of freedom to play and explore. Uh, that's your experience, isn't it? It is. It is, yes. Um, uh, as I said, you know, as, as I was mentioning, you know, experimenting with the sonnet. Um, you know, um, you can now have, well, there are sonnet crowns and, uh, Jericho, the American poet Jericho Brown, um, gutted the sonnet and added some of the guzzle and the blues poem to create the duplex. Yeah. We'll talk about that a bit later on when you, when you, when you read one. Sure. Sure. Um, there's also, you know, with the guzzle as well, there's sort of a, it's not, set in stone but there's a sort of preferred you know between five and i can't remember what the upper sort of limit is 15, but 15 and thanks and you 20. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> yeah well that's that was that was exactly my next point that uh that that rules in poetry are made for poets to break if you if you you know once you're familiar enough with the the, the form and you know what you're doing uh you know once you're competent enough to to break it mm. uh, then, then rules are made to be broken. And poets are always exploring and stretching the limits of form and, and the limits of language. And, you know, from what you said, that, that's something that appeals to you too. It does. Uh, I... You know, sometimes a, a poem, sometimes a poem I write in a fixed form maybe uh quite experimental and could be written in a quite experimental way or appear as uh as a quite experimental form on the page um but i love you know i i read broadly and i i love incorporating elements of you know experimental poetry and lyric poetry and uh all sorts of poetry uh, into these forms um and you know, I I hope that writing in form appeals to readers and other other poets. Um, it uh, it from my perspective, it, it seems to be becoming more and more appreciated, and that's that's exciting. Um, I know that you know there are some really quite high profile writers of uh po- sorry high, high profile poets who write 
almost exclusively in form as uh, Alicia Stallings uh, from the US, who lives in Greece. Um, I, um, I I love her work. She's a a big inspiration. And um, yes, I think perhaps there's a greater appreciation for formal poetry in America, but I see that changing in Australia and they're becoming a, a greater appreciation here, um, which I love, you know, because uh, fixed form fixed form poetry may have that echo of, of, of a Shakespearean sonnet, but it doesn't have to be about love. As I said before, it, it can be about absolutely anything and it can be, it can be as, uh, I don't know, as, for want of a better phrase, sort of as Alice in Wonderland, as, as you want it to be. Um, and that's certainly the case of some of the poems in Like to the Lark that are in fixed form. So it's sort of that I, I kind of like the idea of sort of seducing somebody into a poem that has a very perhaps conservative form, but the poem isn't conservative at all. Mm. Yeah. Well, the more I read them, the more I found in them, which is uh, part of the part of the joy. Um, but I, I've got a before we get onto any of these poems, I've got a couple of chicken egg, chicken and egg questions for you, Stuart. Sure. Um, when you write a poem, what comes first, the words and language or the form? Hmm. Hmm. Sometimes the words and language, sometimes the form. <laughs> perhaps, a perhaps a frustrating response. <laughs> no. uh, I, I walk a lot and often, um, you know, just a word or a phrase or, or an idea for a poem will, will arrive. Um, and uh, the form that that will come the form that, that that will be written in is sort of largely intuited, intuited. Um, but sometimes I do sit down and think, okay, I I really want to write a Sestina, mm. uh, but what's this? What what am I going to write about in this Sestina? Mm. Uh, so the the period uh, the the more the the longer I write, the more I'm noticing that there's a longer a longer period between uh, thinking and the act of writing. Mm. So there's a gestation period for the poem. That's right. That's right. And sometimes mm, a poem, it, it happens rarely, but, but sometimes a poem will, will come out almost entirely on the page, but it's, it's sort of actually been written up here uh, mm. for God knows how long. Um, you know, I mean, I, I really don't know. I really can't answer that because I, I, I don't, I don't understand. Uh, I don't understand mystery. that process. That's the mystery. We love, the, we love, <laughs> we love the mystery as as well. We love the mystery of how these things turn up sometimes we, unannounced. Um, we do. I, I, I do know that. Uh, if I can just make one more comment about that please I, I do know that um if I've had a period of not writing sometimes writing a sonnet or a villanelle or a sestina um it's sort of uh it's like a it's like a warm-up mm. before a, you know before a 10k race um it's sort of a way of getting back into mm. um into that. I mean, I, I've been working on this poem uh, for the last couple of weeks, and it's still deciding what form it's. It started out as a pantoum, and then as a triolet, and then three other forms, and it's finally gone back to a triolet, and and now it's working. Uh, uh, I, my, how did you know that was going to be my next question? I was going to ask you, how do you know when you start a poem, which form suits the poem? Does the, does the poem choose the form or does the form give rise to the poem? Yeah, look, again, <laughs> I don't know. Uh, I, I really, 
I really do rely on gut feeling, on intuition. Um, I, I really, I allow, I allow myself to sort of sit with that idea for as long as I need to, or if I don't do that, then I will just sit down and uh, start typing in my laptop, which which is often the more frustrating way of going about it. Mm. Um, uh, but inevitably, I will leave something, or I will uh, I'll leave it and then go for a walk, and something will come to me, or or I'll sort of you know, have just a three or five word phrase and I'll, I'll think, hang on, that would that that would sound good in that form. Um, and it's also just through through reading so many uh, fixed form poems and and sort of having an, having a sense of what those of why those of the oh, sorry of the history of those forms. Mm. Um, but as I said before, also, also, you know, green lighting that it's okay to to break that form. Uh, sorry, not to break the form, but sorry to to flex the form and flex the ideas of what that form can can actually contain of what it mm. can hold. Which you do in the first poem you're going to read. Yes. Yeah. Shall we? Sure. Thanks. Uh, so there's a small uh, epigraph. Uh, for this poem from Judith Wright's Black Cockatoos. Uh, I could hear the wild black cockatoos tossed on the crest of their high trees, crying the world's unrest. And the poem is called Offworld Guzzle. Are you ready for the roundup, world? Put your atlas down and feet up, world. Give me the keys, the GPS. You thrash the hell out of the pickup, world. What's your pleasure? Horse's neck, monkey gland, cobra's fang, the knight's a pup, world. Once you were razor sharp, a global knife, like stainless steel nerve cracks up, world. Riled black cockatoos cried your unrest, more than a storm in a teacup, world. You unsealed records of days and nights when earth's giant oak was wrought up, world. Into fantastic garlands of white-leaved willow, you wove buttercup, world. You provoked arctic ice, synthetic ice, ice. Your pick never let up, world. Your coal mind and mechanical eyes turned the sea of light downside up, world. Glued to a screen, you approved lineages, languages, lands, smash up, world. Don't move a muscle. Let me freshen your drink. You look like death warmed up, world. You built tall walls with stone boat loaded stars thrown from an ark into up, world. You guzzled every radif but one. Your tacalus you covered up, world. Peter Van Esk, you gurgled, thought yourself clever and never grew up, world. Thunder lightning didn't meet again. In smoke your ambition went up, world. Umpteen charges valuable as Mar-a-Lago, each as trumped up, world. A defamation suit, colourful, flimsy, in court it won't stand up, world. No more tricks and abracadabra, your fascination is used up, world. You wish to go the way of all flesh imperially, a death cup, world. You won't feel a thing, so long, farewell. Arriva Dirci, bottoms up, world. Yeah, so this one's uh, in couplets, as they are, and you've got your sort of two things going on. You've got world ending each couplet, the word world, but there's also something finishing up before that. Yes. Um, did you... How do you do this? Do you write this a couplet at a time? And so you think of a couplet and you're off you go and you write a couplet and then what's what's the next couplet going to mean? How, how, how do you how do you string it up? How do you string it together? That used to be my process. Now I uh, just put put down phrases on uh, on the page as they come to me, um, primarily so I don't forget them. 
but also I think, well, they're sort of a part of this poem, but I'm not quite sure where, where they're going to fit sonically um, uh, or in terms of mood. Um, sometimes I, I think, oh, that, that would actually make for a kind of great conclusion. So, you know, I'll, I'll work on that and sort of, you know, so sometimes the end of the poem will be there before the beginning of the poem is. Uh, and this is one particular poem that was, that my, my writing was quite, uh, quite all over the place. Uh, I, I, as soon as I started thinking about the the state of the world and thinking about, you know, and I, I've I've never said, I've always said this poem is either about the world talking to itself, having gone mad, having having driven itself mad, or it's someone addressing the world. Mm. Um, uh, yeah, and really as soon as I started thinking about those two ideas, uh, a number of images uh, started appearing and I found I just had to get these down on paper as quickly as possible without losing them. Um, and then it was sort of a matter of uh, uh, reading and researching and then uh, editing later. So you had all those, all these little couplets and then you had to try to work out what order to put them in? Is it, was it... Was that part yeah, of so couplets and pieces of couplets, and sometimes those, sometimes pieces from certain couplets had to be, or sometimes I moved pieces from certain couplets to a later couplet or an earlier couplet. Uh, sometimes couplets, you know, went up a couple of couplets or down several couplets. Uh, so this one, it, it was actually a lot of fun. I mean, it's, it's to some people, it might sound like a total nightmare of a way to write a poem. But for me, it was a lot of fun because it's there was just this sort of explosion of, of image. And it was like, wow, OK, OK, where to begin? And for me, this was uh, a, a, a quite a, a quite new way of uh, writing. Um, because normally I would try to, normally I would start with the first line and try to get the first line or the first couple of lines down and then, you know, see, see line for line where the poem goes after that. But this, this was a, a very different process and it was a hell of a lot of fun. Um, there were things coming to me from music I love and uh, things that I was reading about you know, Antarctic ice and, uh, you know, uh, and capital ice and uh, ice methamphetamine and, um, yeah, all sorts of things. It really does take in, yeah, th this poem sort of takes in a lot and it's a poem about the world. So that sort of makes sense. But it was, um, yeah, it was, a it was a really, it was a fun one to write. So how many how many couplets would you have had to discard at the end? Like, yeah, that's a good question. I think probably about twenty or thirty. Right. So this is pared down. I mean, there were longer versions of this, and you just sort of like, okay, we've got to pare it down, or or this. Yes, was, yeah. there were, and I entered it into the Montreal. I can't remember what the line limit is for poems there, but oh. uh, I I knew I wanted to enter it into that prize and. Uh, so I sort of paired it back because of that and it still worked, mm. uh, even taking those, those couplets out and, and looking at those couplets later, they're, they're not very good. So I'm glad that they were taken out anyway. And I'm glad the poem is, is as it is. Um, yeah, there were, I mean, there were some other sort of interesting couplets, but they weren't, they just didn't, I, I didn't feel like they had the same kind of oomph that some of, some of these couplets do. Um, the idea was there, but not the execution. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, some of them are just, I, I had a laugh when I got to the Mar-a-Lago and the, <laughs> so some good stuff in there. Um, so did you want to talk a little bit better? I mean, I don't know whether we, we have time, but did you want to talk a little bit about the guzzle and a bit about the form and how you came across it? And, uh, sure. Um, I think it was uh, Aga Shahid, Shahid Ali. Um, I don't remember the name of uh, one of his guzzles that I read, 
but I fell in love with it and then uh, started reading uh, more guzzles and then read some of uh, Australian poet Andy Jackson's guzzles. Yeah, I love his guzzles. Yeah, they, they, they're beautiful. And uh, yeah, I um, found it a very, very complex, very tricky uh, and difficult form to write. And for that reason, I had to write more <laughs> of them. <laughs> and I'm not saying that I've mastered the guzzle, far from it, but um, I do love a challenge and that's what writing in that's that's another uh, aspect of writing in fixed forms for me so uh it, yeah it, it was my my process with all the fixed forms is uh is reading them and feeling the the music in them um and the resonance and uh and them opening up um, a music in me that I want to explore. Um, and, you know, I, as a kid, I wanted to be a rock star, but I'm far too shy. <laughs> so my way of exploring is, is writing these poems. Uh, but I, I, think, I think it's a wonderful form. The early ones, the early guzzles I wrote, um, and the, I was speaking with Felicity Plunkett about this. The jury's still out on whether it's guzzle or hazal or huzzle. Um, I think most people just say guzzle because it's easier. And uh, uh, But my early guzzles were five couplets. Mm. Actually, you, uh, actually another, uh, another early guzzle I read was by Patricia Smith. I think it's called Hip Hop Guzzle. Uh, at Poetry Foundation, really clever, really witty, um, and you know, reading poems like that, I uh, yeah, it, uh, it, it, it again gave me the kind of green light that I needed to move to move, you know, to some degree away from writing mostly serious poetry to, I mean, a, a lot of the poems in this book were consciously written um, by trying to um, uh, put some wit and, and some humour into the poems. Well, as you said, you know, there are some serious topics here, but I wanted to, uh, I, I wanted them to, um, you know, in some way be tongue in cheek or, you know, give the reader a laugh as well as they're going along. And uh, yeah. So do you do you sort of say oh, okay? I'm, I'm going to write a guzzle now because that's a that's a challenge. I want to I want to see if I'm up for it. Is that is that part of the thing? It is. It is. Yeah. 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 I I yeah. I feel like <laughs> I feel like making my life complicated for the next year. <laughs> so and, I'm, I mean, right. are you are you kind of like restless in sort of um canvassing lots of different forms because you're looking for lots of different challenges <laughs> yes yes absolutely i mean i um there it, it's it's always uh a, a challenge um it's always challenging uh even writing an eight line triolet which has repeating lines and i think you're actually only writing four original lines in an eight line poem but it's an incredibly complex form and to actually make it work is uh, is is really challenging, um, but I adore that challenge, uh, and I, I I love I love how I feel. I love my headspace when when I'm uh, when I'm writing those challenging poems, those challenging forms. It'd have to be a lot of failures for every success, wouldn't it? Oh God, yeah, <laughs> a lot. A lot, a lot, of, a lot of failures, a lot of things discarded and a lot of edits. I mean, most of my poems nowadays probably go through a hundred plus edits, um, oh. you know, so there's a lot in each poem. And part of that is also trying to write something in a fixed form that doesn't feel fixed, that doesn't feel rigid or clunky, that feels fluid as well. So because mm. a lot of the earlier fixed form poems I wrote did feel really clunky and mm. 
you know you want something to feel well i do anyway i want something to feel sort of loose and open mm. and expansive mm. you know? um so we talked about you mentioned earlier that uh, you thought that the guzzle had to be between five and 15 couplets and this one's this one's longer yes um, do you clearly you've researched the the rules around the form um to what extent do you and you're talking about flexing the form so what to what extent do you try and follow or depart from the rules mm, okay i think now my only um following is the actual form itself and uh everything else is departure so uh you know topic theme mood music um you know so i don't i don't think i've actually written a guzzle about uh about loss of love or the pain of lost love but you know the uh the joy of having loved um you know i've decided to write one about a mad world instead mm. which which was you know i mean that idea itself was inspired by the song mad world um yeah. and there are some other musical references in there too so i, I would say now like uh, i in the beginning i used to adhere quite strictly to okay well that's a sonnet that's a guzzle that's a pantoum so that's what you know so that poem needs to be about love love and love and <laughs> now i you know i i don't um, you got into your post love phase <laughs> that's right <laughs> i love love but i don't really like writing about love i mean well i write about love well, no, you do you do and we're going to read at least one of those poems well yes 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 you know you're right yeah <laughs> um now i don't know i mean i don't know much about guzzles I've, i love andy jackson's and we we had him do some of them on a poet's corner some time ago um but uh this poem uh almost seems to be a soliloquy addressed to the world whether it's mm. whether it's the world addressing itself or someone addressing it is that what you had in mind is it is, is it is a soliloquy a, a feature of the guzzle ah oh, i actually don't know I don't know, but it could be. Um, it I love that, David. That's great. <laughs> <laughs> it is now. <laughs> and and you know, you're talking about musicality and different things. Can you say something about the tone of this this particular puzzle? Because it seems to me to be a sort of bit of an end of days rant and a bit of accusation and a bit of condemnation and fairly critical. Absolutely, yes. Um, look, I'll just I'll just have a a, a quick look at it if that's okay so i had uh as well as starting with a particular form it started with uh the epigraph i mm. uh, i love red tailed black cockatoos and i love the judith wright poem black mm. cockatoos and i was thinking about uh that that idea of a um, a, uh, a knife fight in a telephone booth, and you know, um, fighting in Australian you know poetry wars, and so that that's an element of of this as well. So that's where more in a, more than a storm in a teacup world comes in. Uh, but um, yeah, it look it is part it is part rant. It's part. Um, you know, there's something sort of at various moments sort of quietly reflective and uh, elements of regret. Mm. Um, you know, if I if I didn't do this, then I, I wouldn't be in this state. I wouldn't be, uh, yeah, I, I wouldn't be ranting it's actually really interesting i'm thinking now as i'm speaking about what you said about the soliloquy and um that yeah addressing addressing oneself or addressing the the audience with those sort of inner thoughts and 
the reason why I wanted to call this off off world guzzle was to just I suppose even give, give an even greater sense of discombobulation to the poem mm. um you know like is the world actually off world or you know is is off world a, a metaphor for something um but really I, I think mostly it's a I would say mostly it's a poem of regret um and uh I was listening a lot I hadn't listened to it a long time but I was listening to the Cure's Wish album and I was thinking about the world and what the world might wish for mm. and then I was sort of thinking of the opposite of that what what might the world have wished it didn't do mm. as opposed to what it could do um yeah so I wondered whether your use of world throughout this poem was a metaphor for humanity absolutely mm. yeah yeah definitely I mean I, I find it quite horrifying what we've done to the world and what we continue to do to the world um and uh as i think is pretty pretty clear in the poem right. um but i also wanted to throw in some i guess lighter references like to you know peter pan and um mm. you know words like abracadabra um some sort of childhood uh references also um mm. But yeah, it, at the same time, um, you know, uh, does the world eat the death cup at the end of the poem, or you know, uh, and and take its own life, or uh, does the poem end hopefully? And that's why I wanted this poem at the beginning of the book, mm. um, as opposed to the end. I think it would have been making a very different statement if this poem had been at the end of the book, mm. if it had been the final guzzle as opposed mm. to the first. Mm. Yeah, so in, in a sense, I, I wanted to open up the world and open up the reader's imagination to the world. And, and open up the conversation. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm. Um, you mentioned a little bit about how... Uh, Poets speak to poets of different eras and the history of conversations between poetic generations and between poets and readers. And there's a long, there's a long tradition of poets conversing, you know, through poetry in that way. Yeah. yeah. You have some very helpful and very interesting notes at the end of the book, um, from which it's clear that uh, your poems are in conversation with the writings of many other poets and thinkers which is true also of this poem, as you've mentioned, starting with um, Judith Wright and some of the other references. Mm. Can you say something about the importance of that for you? Yeah, sure. I mean, it, it's... Um, I suppose I love to reflect uh, in my own work, uh, the work of um, other writers that I love. Um, I like to try to contribute well i i hope i'm contributing to and maybe even expanding on that that conversation of of writers who've written in the past and writers who are writing now um that's why you know i'm not only including references to uh writers who are no longer alive but also to you know to, to writers who are alive and also to um musicians who are alive as well. There are references in here to uh, um, several Susie and the Banshees tracks, uh, mm -hmm. for example, and Susie Sue's still alive. But I, um, it's, I, I don't know whether those references are conscious. I think I'm just, you know, between you and me and everybody else who's watching, I... <laughs> A group of friends and I in our 20s um, at, at a particular job, we used to read <laughs> such a confession, New Weekly. <laughs> and, <laughs> but I also read, used to read a lot of magazines like The Face and uh, a lot of music magazines, Spin and, 
and whatnot and be very an enemy and be very uh, it, growing growing up in Hobart you know going and seeing bands it was you know you sort of had to go to Melbourne to see um anyone decent and, and, and any internationals as well so um in a sense I'm trying to have conversations with these musicians who kind of fueled my passion for writing to begin with mm. um and um yeah I, I i have just always loved this idea of speaking to and speaking back to and um of of poetry being an open conversation mm. cool. yeah um whether it be uh, fixed form or free verse poetry. Yeah. Yeah. Can we read another one? Sure. Uh, this one's called, um, well, this is a love poem, but it's about a cake and it's called Persian Love Cake. My purple shirted prince is waking in the Queensland sun. Today's his birthday. I sliver green pistachios. Baking in the Queensland sun, I twirl dried rosebuds, sliver green pistachios, swirl golden bulbs in a pan. I twirl dried rosebuds, pulse black aphrodisiacs, lick golden bulbs in a pan, sorry, swirl golden bulbs in a pan, lick stars of almond praline, the impulse paradisiac. He is rosewater cream, starry like almond praline, and cool as lemon icing. He is rosewater cream, a purple shirted prince, is cooling like lemon, icing. Today is his birthday. Go on, Stuart. That's not just about the cake. <laughs> it's not just about the cake, but it's mostly about the cake. It's my favorite cake. <laughs> <laughs> um, so now this is a pantoum. It is a pantoum, uh, yes. but it's it's quite different from it's quite different from the traditional form, isn't it? Where the second and fourth lines of each stanza serve as the first and third lines of the next. You haven't quite done that. Um, you varied that that form, but it works. Um, what prompted you? Uh, I've, no, I've sort of slightly reworked or remixed some lines to yeah. to make them work. Um, yeah, sometimes I, you know, make life easier for myself and <laughs> let myself be a bit flexible <laughs> yeah. with these rules. So in the notes at the end of the book, you say, um, in the pantoum, lines echo spell-like between stanzas, simultaneously expanding and contracting the form's energies. Mm. Can you elaborate on that? Is that is that expansion and contraction about the breath or or musicality of the poem? Uh, it's about both. Um, for this particular poem, it's probably more about musicality and and with it the sense of, um, you know, making a cake and folding those ingredients and those uh, layers, folding those ingredients into each other, and uh, and, and the cake and rises. The cake so rises. And <laughs> contraction of the cake. <laughs> Not contraction, I hope, just expansion. Just expansion, and hopefully the yeah, hopefully the cake doesn't you know flop at the <laughs> end. Uh, no, but it's it's also a, a, about um, and I you know uh, for me personally about feeling more comfortable uh, about writing about love, um, albeit kind of under the guise of actually of writing about a cake, uh, and. Uh, yeah, so it, it, it was an exercise in uh, writing about the expansion of love and um, as well as writing about a cake. Um, it, the, the, the music of this, um, the poem actually started out with... Um, a line from the Sugar Cube song "Birthday," um, which I first heard as a teenager, and I've loved Bjork's 
work with the sugar cubes and solo ever since. Um, and a friend uh, used to make a Persian love cake for me on my birthday. Mm. So those two thoughts gelled. And um, that's, yeah, that's how this poem came into being. And uh, I, I was actually quite anxious writing this poem. Um, it's not about anyone in particular. Um, it's more about writing about the, I the idea of love being something that evolves and changes. Uh, it's also about the idea of, you know, um, a platonic love. And for me, platonic love is, you know, um, I mean, I really love my friends. There's a sense of, in my friendships, like I almost feel like, you know, people talk about being in love and I feel that in my friendships, there's that sense of being in love with my friends, but not in a, not in a romantic way, mm. in, in a, in a platonic in love way, which doesn't really make sense. Um, but I suppose I was thinking about those the ways we try to fold love and the ways that we're folded and enfolded by love and the pantoum with those echoing and repeating with those repeating lines seem the perfect form mm. uh, to explore that and expand on that. Um, and you do a nice thing here because the lines that repeat some of them are the same, but some of them have got these very subtle variations, and you're, you know, there's a lot of sort of wordplay, um, mm. which mm. in a way seems to me to give it a kind of the lightness of a cake rising, if you like. Um, how, how much fun was it to rhyme aphrodisiacs with paradisiac? <laughs> it was a lot of fun. <laughs> I love it. As well as rhyming, I sing with I sing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know. I mean, I love that. I love that play. It's so good. Um, so love is often expressed through the act of doing or making something for someone. Mm. And there's a kind of quiet delight as the narrator of the poem sits about making the cake. Is that what you're trying to convey? This, this quiet, this, this just delight, this pleasure? enjoyment it is like it's it's a gentle love um and it's well it's gentle and powerful and the the lines slash ingredients bind it and make it powerful um yet the the lightness of you know pistachios and rosebuds and golden bulbs mm. uh, keep it light and and airy um and you know there are some poems in this collection you know in in like to the lark that you know people have said that's you know quite heavy so it was a conscious probably the only conscious thing about writing this poem was actually trying to write a light poem mm. um, or write a light poem in response to people who were saying, oh, geez, that's a, that's a bloody heavy one. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, I get my sense when reading the poem is throughout the poem is kind of restrained. Um, mm. because it's, not, it's not boisterous. But no. then, you, then you get to the last line, which to me, and you didn't read it that way, but I, you know, I could have read it. I sing today's his birthday. You know, yeah, yeah. Uh, it, it seemed to me when I read it, kind of irrepressible. You know, bubbling, bubbling up with effusiveness and joy. So, yeah. so it turned the poem to me into a celebration of a celebration. There I like go. that. Thanks, David. <laughs> so, now, now, this is a very important question I have for you now. Sure. Uh, what is a Persian love cake and where can I get one? <laughs> Gosh, uh, <laughs> nowhere around where I live, um, I don't think. But have you ever had one? No. They're absolutely delicious. Okay, I'm on the hunt now. I'm on, I'm, yeah, I'm yeah. on the hunt for them. 
Yeah. <laughs> I'm sure you'll find a great one. <laughs> All right. So we're we going to move from Persian love cakes to dust bunnies. Sure. Great. Okay. Dust bunnies. So small, so mousy. We seem powerless, but we seize web of spider, hair of you. We swallow pollen, but are flowerless, and carrot atoms, these we curse. Please view our Lilliputian lightning show. Wasp stings, red bed bug beaks, and cockroach claws are sung as if by Shakespeare's sisters into strings that in the night go bump, so hold your tongue. But we are more alive than dead. Here, see the spores of mushrooms plume in us. Dust mites assemble prams and rams, and DDT takes stock, takes stock. Micrometeorites, our stomach stones, are sweet. We eat, we eat, and like a rocky planet, we accrete. Yeah, I, I enjoyed uh, hearing you read that. I enjoyed reading it on the page. One of the things I love about poetry is um, discovering where the poet's wandering eye has landed. Now, now tell me how on earth you was landed on dust bunnies, because I don't think I've ever seen a poem about dust bunnies before. Okay, so uh, I, I landed on this by looking under my bed. And <laughs> I don't think I need to say any more. Okay. Uh, it was at the last house I lived at, and I thought, oh, I, you know, haven't haven't been under there for a while. I mean, I had, you know, uh, <laughs> I had vacuumed under there, but not not well enough. And there was a particular dust bunny under there, and this might sound strange, but it was actually it had a, a, a quite beautiful shape. And I thought I'm going to write a poem about dust bunnies. And then I I started reading about dust bunnies, and the poem really is about. You know, I mean, dust bunnies do have little lightning shows in them, and these are the poem is really about some of the things that 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 they gather. I mean, they really do gather bits of micrometeorites and spores of mushrooms, um, uh, and you know, DDT has been found in them as well. And I just thought, wow, like this, you know, this sort of thing that you know we walk over and don't you know nobody ever thinks about dust bunnies until you clean and you know perhaps we don't even really think much about them much about them beyond that i thought well no, they dust bunnies deserve a poem yeah and a sonnet no less <laughs> and a sonnet <laughs> well uh the thing about dust bunnies is that they are they're both ubiquitous and i think invisible you know when we, we we, we don't we don't we don't want to see them we don't see them um were you were you just apart from the fact that your curiosity was piqued uh when you did your research we just playing with the notion uh that they are both you know ubiquitous and and invisible and wanting to make visible what is unseen or do you have a more serious objective in writing the poem uh no i mean that that was definitely a part of it um there are and there are other poems in the book as well that 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 are about something insignificant that you know actually is quite powerful or can be quite powerful mm. um, or mighty or has a lot of strength and uh so that was that was what i was trying to pour into this poem um and to say you know like these look at these little things you know they you know we just think they're yeah i, I mean i really i just think i didn't know how they formed or what they were comprised of and then when i was researching them you know i was just it's absolutely fascinating like wow bits of micrometeorites that's incredible mm. Mm. <laughs> but of course of course there are bits of micrometeorites in dust bunnies um there was also um a sense of uh again music you know i was listening to some shakespeare's sister and the shakespeare's sisters in the poem is a reference not only to uh, Shakespeare, but also to um, the Smiths song, uh, Shakespeare's Sister, and also the band um, mm. did that great song, Stay, with that incredible film clip. Um, and, yeah, so, uh, again, there's that speaking to, you know, um, other writers and musicians. 
Um, but like so many of my other poems, this is is was an opportunity to learn, and um, I never enjoyed learning in a university environment. But I loved, I love the way I learn. I love um, you know reading and going to the library and you know getting out you know, uh, borrowing books that have information about dust bunnies. Um, I sort of love learning on my own terms. And, uh, you know, so this was, um, you know, it, it was sort of setting my, I was setting myself a little exercise here. How much can I learn and how much of that can, you know, go into a poem and will it actually work as a poem? And, and if so, what form? Mm. Yeah. And and in a way, the sonnet's the perfect form because it's the this is a kind of like the anti-sonnet, in a way because uh, you know the traditional sonnet pre-Shakespeare was had to be about love, like you said. Um, yeah. um, so one of the things I wanted to ask you about writing in in poetic forms and you know a form like the sonnet, which is so traditional and it's been around for so long. Um, do you feel that you need to mitigate? the risk uh, of writing in that form by by subject matter i think so yeah i do i do um i must admit you know i i i do think will will readers not read my work you know if it's clearly a sonnet or if it's called for example sonnet 29 as one of the poems in this book is uh so uh that that is another reason why i why i why i guess this is an anti-sonnet um it's you know it's ultimately about um loss and well perhaps not loss but devouring and consuming um i suppose you can say love is about those <laughs> devouring and consuming too yes <laughs> so maybe maybe it is about love after all um but i found the sonnets that resonated most strongly for me over the years were the ones that weren't about love were the ones that um uh, played with theme that broke broke uh broke that idea of what a sonnet had to be about well i mean shakespeare the poem references shakespeare as you as you mentioned and shakespeare himself was not just a great exponent of sonnets but but he he explored themes that challenged the traditional sonnets up to that time he, yeah. argu he arguably opened up new terrain for the sonnet form um so is your reference to Shakespeare a salute to what he did with the form in a way? Yeah, it is. It is. I, I love Shakespeare's sonnets. I have a really great edition of his sonnets and I read it often and I have uh, favourite sonnets of his. Sonnet 29 is, is one in particular, and which is why I honour that with my own Sonnet 29, which is, which is a terminal, so it uses the end words of his Sonnet 29. Um, hmm. Yeah, it, it is it is an honouring um, and an honouring of um, yeah of uh, his plays also. Um, I love Shakespeare. I, you know, I yeah, and I'm not ashamed to admit it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, have you ever stopped to wonder what Shakespeare might make of this poem? <laughs> I haven't actually. <laughs> I'll leave you with that thought. Um, did you want to um, talk a bit about um, the the characteristics of the sonnet that you you employed in this poem? Sure. So um, it's written in well, it's written mostly in iambic pentameter. Hmm. Uh, so with the stress on every second syllable. Um, and the uh, end rhyme also mm. um, and also the the volta so that 
turn at the seventh line, which ends, yeah. but we are more alive than dead. Yeah. Um, yeah, so there is adherence to those rules, um, but that's about where it ends. <laughs> and as I said, there's that triple reference in Shakespeare's sisters as well. So it's not just honouring uh, Shakespeare, but also the Smiths and Shakespeare's sister who named themselves after that Smith song. Um, so there's kind of a an honouring, there's sort of several honourings. A chain, a chain of honour, honourings. chain of honourings. <laughs> concatenation of honorings yeah <laughs> all right shall we now the next poem you're going to read is yep. you know, a form of your own invention so mm. let's have a read of that sure so this is uh it forms called the terse terse set which is a pun on tercet uh it's called sketching aids and uh that can be read two ways but i'll read the poem first uh sketching aids on a queen size sheet, two men, one dog in between their legs, blue set squares, fog and grief preen, then rule who will prologue, the blown spleen, the skins few, the cells slog. There's a lot more in this poem than first meets the eye, I think. There so is. Let's start, let's start with the title in the two ways. Sure. So um, I was at home one night looking through uh, old photos um, of a uh, partner who had AIDS. Um, at the same time, I don't know why, but I was thinking about, uh, I well, I, I, I met him uh, when I was in year 12 and I think in year 11, I did technical drawing. So, uh, so one reading of the title is the aids that you use in technical drawing. So there's one of those mentioned in each stanza. Uh, there's the sheet in the first, which is the sheet of paper. There's the set square in the second. There's the rule or the ruler mm. in the third. Um, and the cell in the second. Um, I became very upset looking at uh, this photo of my partner, my then partner, and also very uh, nostalgic about uh, that time at school. I hated technical drawing. I really hated it. I wished I could be off, you know, like playing music or writing, writing poems instead. Um, and I don't know. I... I really don't know why I wrote a poem about technical drawing and AIDS. I, uh, but the, the, the phrase on a queen size sheet, two men, one dog in between their legs, blue set squares, just that, that came to me. And then I realized that I had the form, uh, queen rhymed with in between, two with blue. And I thought, oh, okay. Um, what rhymes with dog? What rhymes with dog? Fog. <laughs> uh, it's a really strict form. Uh, as I said, it's written in tercets. And really it's, uh, I talk about this at the back of the book, it, it's about my way of dealing with the grief of um, not only that partner's diagnosis, uh, we were together at the time, uh, when he was diagnosed, but also um, his dying uh, several years ago um, before uh, before the pandemic um, arrived. And uh, so it, it, it's, I didn't want to write, I wanted to write a poem that acknowledged the challenges of living with AIDS, but I wanted it to be a hopeful poem, mm. which is why the poem ends with the word slog. Um, you know, there was a fight, you know, um, a partner was given only a very short time to live and he ended up living for, I think, 20 plus years. Mm. He was very, uh, very determined. 
and you know achieved a lot and I think perhaps even surprised himself at what he and what humans are capable of mm. uh, so I found the thinking about the rigidity of um, technical drawing corresponded to the rigidity of writing in in this form that I called the terse set. Um, and really it was a way of containing, you know, because when, when I was thinking about this partner and thinking about school and high school and uh, um, and friends from high school and other experiences at high school. Yeah, I, I became, you know, quite overwhelmed um, and, and, and really upset. And uh, I, it actually, it really hurt to, um, it sort of hurt to touch. I, it's one of a few poems that I, wrote on paper and it almost hurt to touch the page there was a sense of sort of burning and I kind of wanted to like just get words down really quickly and I didn't want to rush away from the poem or rush away from the ideas that I'm talking about in the poem but it was it was actually a really unbearable poem to write um well, but I'm glad I wrote it. it well, and thank you for share, for sharing it with us. Um, for me, it starts with this very strong and clear image, and then, um, which was the image that you had to start off with, um, and then swivels to um, a more abstract emotional state of you know fog and grief. Mm. Are you um, conveying the prompt of the image? And the emotional response to it, or are you trying to say something more? Hmm. I suppose with this poem, I'm I come back to communicating with other poems and other the forms of writing and this was what I hoped could be or might be a contribution to the creative writing about HIV AIDS that mm -hmm. other poets and other writers have created and um, in particular I was thinking about and this comes up in another poem that that um, that I'm going to read uh, uh, this partner gave me a, uh, a copy of uh, Timothy Conagrave is holding the man. So it was a way of, um, it was a way of contributing, hopefully contributing to a larger conversation. It was a way of saying, uh, fuck you to people who told me I couldn't write about HIV AIDS, that I shouldn't, that I mustn't write about HIV AIDS, that, you know, people who, live with HIV and have died of AIDS uh, don't deserve to have their stories told so it's actually quite it's a poem of resistance and rebellion mm. uh, it may not seem like it at all but uh, it actually is again it, you know it, it it starts out as a it's a it's quite a quiet poem mm. you know the skin says phew and the spleen is blown, and for the cells, there's a slog. Mm -hmm. So there's some energy, there's some momentum there by the end of it, but it's quite a quiet and gentle poem. Mm. But it's also a poem of, as I said, resistance and rebellion uh, against what um, editors of journals had told me. You know, I mean, tell me, you, tell me you're not wanting to publish my work. There's no need to tell me that you know, what I'm writing about is disgusting and, mm. you know, all sorts of things that I've heard over the years and, um, yeah, being told yeah. that, you know, we've had one, Tim Conagrave, we don't need another. We've got one, Christus uh, Chalkus, we don't need another. And, uh, you know, of course, that 
made me angry and it made me even more determined to write about what I want to write about yeah and to honor the life of a really amazing person yeah and then the ultimate response to that is to write the poem and get it published absolutely mm. absolutely yeah now this is a form that you've invented mm. uh, and you've called it as you said the terse set which is a play on words on the tercet yep um and you've written about this form in the notes on form at the end of the book um can you tell us what you're trying to do with this form and how it differs from the tercet sure uh so um the tercet uh can be uh in a traditional tercet the line can be any length uh, in this, and this harks back to uh, uh, to my experience of OCD, and uh, uh, I have a thing for the number three, and uh, also three lines, H three syllables, three lines, three syllables a line, uh, and also HIV, mm. uh, and. Uh, so I, I wanted a very tight form, um, and I also wanted a, I wanted a very tight form to hold me as well. Because when I was sitting on the couch uh, writing this poem, I needed uh, my housemate was in bed, and it was really late. It was too late to call anyone, and and um, yeah, sort of uh, break down over the phone. So I just broke down at home instead and threw it. Uh, threw it into this poem and uh, the poem held me, the form held me and I wanted, uh, I thought, oh, okay, there's, there's a, there's a tercet. So the, I didn't think, I didn't conscious, uh, as I said, that sort of first, the first sort of four and a half or five lines just sort yeah. of arrived and the, the name for it or thinking of a name for it came came later but this particular form so the terse set and other terse that's have written are really about trying to sit with grief and manage grief and anger as mm. well but did the form come almost accidentally it did it did yeah yeah because um, you had those first four and a half five lines and then you, you thought oh i can do something with this and... yeah that's right that's right and and look i think I think when things like that happen, there, you know, I think it maybe it just comes from reading a lot, just you know, being aware of, you know, I, I think around that time, perhaps I've been reading uh, some of Platt's poems that she'd written in Tercets, mm -hmm. um, and you know, I, I think you know, I'd never uh, sort of write. I'd, tried writing in tercets before but again because there was no no greater rigidity than actually writing in a tercet those poems that I wrote never really went anywhere so when I realized what what had come out in those first five lines and the strictness there um I really latched onto it and then the rest of the poem beyond that was quite quite hard work trying to mm. ensure that there were only three syllables a line and to get and this this is actually um the version that was the earlier version that was published the last sort of four lines are quite different mm. uh, and it was quite um yeah it was actually quite oblique and it was through working with um my my close friend Felicity Plunkett, who edited the book, and she suggested that I rework several lines, and it it made it a, um, I think a, a stronger and more, a, and a clearer poem. And it's it's your consciousness of form that enables you to uh, invent a new form. So if, if it was me and I'd written those first five lines, I wouldn't have had a clue that there was a form there to emerge from. You know what I mean? Yes. Yep. Um, yeah. Uh, 
yeah, I, I, I think I'm always looking for looking for form, looking for rule, looking for structure, looking for order, looking for control. You know, <laughs> again, I mean, I, I'm not, you know, it's not a therapy session and I'm not going to go on about OCD all the time, but um, it interests me that, you know, it, to me, it's interesting that, you know, the, there are elements of OCD for me that are about um, uh, order and control. And that certainly is reflected in in these fixed form poems. Mm. Yeah. Um, is the strength of the form, you, you mentioned how tight you wanted it to be, is the strength of the form what is left unsaid in the poem? Yeah. And you leave some work for the reader to, to go and come up with their understanding of it. Yeah, absolutely. And that's why I sort of wanted the title, like there to be two meanings to the title as well. The reader can decide, is it about HIV AIDS or, you know, uh, you know, is its main focus technical drawing? I, I, I really, I think, you know, it's leaning towards HIV AIDS. Um, but yeah, I, I, I think what isn't in a poem or what's suggested is mm. uh, as powerful as what's mm. in the poem. Mm. Um, and that's interesting in itself, learning learning what to leave out, learning what not to say. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um <clears throat> You refer in the notes at the end of the book to the need for concision in the form of trisyllabic lines. Mm. It's exacting and it's demanding and it leaves absolutely no room for error. Yep. How many failed two sets did you write before you wrote one that worked? <laughs> About 50 or 60. <laughs> a lot, a lot. Um, you know, I mean, I would say that of of all my poems, um, but it's uh, yeah. I mean, you can't have those. Um, yeah, you can't have that without the poem. Those those poems that succeed. Um, yeah, and I've I've come to really, really appreciate those uh, those poems, and I I keep all of them sometimes go back to them and take lines or phrases from them so mm. i don't i don't feel that there's ever anything wasted um, mm. yeah do you know of any other poets who've taken up this form uh no no i don't um, all right there's a challenge for you poets out there <laughs> <laughs> okay we're going to shift we're going to shift in Subject matter, mood, everything, form, and go to a prose poem. Yes. Okay. Uh, this one's called Hills Hoist. Over moist grass at windmills, its arms. The way you clutch one sends chills up my spine. My laughter doesn't go unvoiced. Anofriel's cousin was the only thing left standing in Ulloa after Cyclone Tracy. Across the country, other clotheslines rejoiced. A gust fills an almost hung out t-shirt. The clouds are revoiced. Blue pegs for blues. I'll make you do it my way, you tease, even if it kills me. His shouts and claps outvoice the deep mouthed sea. A boisterous wind picks up, colour mills about. Swinging on mums was one of childhood's biggest thrills. I'll bet she voiced her annoyance. In the sunroom, we pogo to a song about dollar bills. Exposed ceiling joists ripple. After dinner, a black comedy set in Royston Vasey. Then the latest Neil's Fram. The bedrooms where we cloister ourselves to meditate. A 60s mistral fan wills calm. You're good for me, I say drowsily like the gills of green oysters. You kiss my mottled eyebrows, buenas noches, whippoorwills. Consider yourself invoiced. 
I turn over, knowing the sharkish stills won't foist themselves upon me while I sleep. In the small hours, a Japanese carrier roysters spills oil into Mauritian waters. Um, so for those viewers who are not from Australia, and we do get viewers overseas, can you explain what a hill's hoist is? Sure. A hill's hoist uh, is, well, it's, it's an old type of clothesline uh, with a central pole and uh, four arms branching off uh, with a uh, line between. So if you were to look at from look at it from above, it would be a a square. If you look at it side on, it's sort of like a, a an open pyramid on a pole. Um, a handle to with a yeah, sorry, a handle up and down. I could go up and down. So it's it's sort of it's quite an iconic um, Australian uh, invention. And we hang our clothes on it to dry. We hang our clothes on it to dry. That's yeah. right. Um, oh, I love this. So the Hills Hoist was an, originally a South Australian invention. I'm from South Australia, so we're very proud of Hills Hoists. <laughs> Just so you know. Um, uh, look, I, I I went through the digital copy I had of this poem with a highlighter, highlighting all the different rhymes and half rhymes. I was, it got a very colourful patchwork quilt, really. It was fantastic. <laughs> um, you must have had so much fun with this. I really did. Um, so the 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 main rhymes are hills or uh, ills and oist mm. uh, from the title. So I wanted oist and ills to be in every sentence or yep. every consecutive sentence. So the first one over moist grass at wind mills its arms. Uh, later on, we've got um, where is it oysters. Uh, Oh, sorry, there's Royston, Vasey, and the latest Nils. Yeah, yeah so I, I really wanted those sounds yeah. to, to echo through the poem yeah. uh, as, as you know, homage to the to the, the sounds of the hill's hoist. Um, and, they, and they do. Uh, and it's like, how, so, I mean, this is a lot of wordplay. Um, how, how important is wordplay for you? It seems to be a big thing in your poetry throughout this book. Yeah, it's um, I suppose I uh, when you ask me that question now, I sort of think of a wet chamois and I'm trying to squeeze every every drop of wordplay out of it that I possibly can. Um, uh, it's it's incredibly important. Um, you know, wordplay uh, also makes me think of of music and I've loved music, you know, since really early childhood you know my parents were always playing music and I was always playing music and we were going out and you know buying a lot of records so uh you know this poem is sort of acknowledging um that as well um in, uh, in particular you know the uh Patti Smith song free money you know we pogo to a song about dollar bills a hell of a lot of fun uh I really with this poem, I, I really wanted to see just how far I could take it without it being over the top. Maybe to some readers it is over the top. Maybe sometimes I even think it's over the top. And, you know, maybe that's okay. Um, but, you know, I, 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 I don't think I could find another, uh, in the dictionary or the thesaurus, I don't think I could find another word with that oist rhyme without repeating myself well, that was actually quite a tricky you got boisterous in there somewhere there's yeah there's boisterous as they as they, as they reread the poem yeah, it's a boisterous <laughs> um well that was a, that that sort of uh, segues into my next question how how do you balance wordplay with the risk of being over the top and overdoing it uh, or the risk of sacrificing meaning for effect. Yeah, sure. It's um, it's a judgment call, isn't it? It is a judgment call. It's a fine line. I mean, there's another poem in the book. Uh, it's got a, it's it's a guzzle. It's, it has a really really long title. It's a guzzle about music, and I think that one 
probably crosses the line into, <laughs> you know, um, you know, I'm really just going for wordplay and just having a total ball. But with this one, I, I really wanted there to be a a kind of, uh, you know, uh, a sensical narrative. Um, so it's just, I think it's important to just to have that awareness, to be conscious and, and to, um, to, uh, to not, to not only be a, a close reader of your own work, but to be an, to try to be an impartial reader of your own work, to try to be an objective reader of your work. And if that means stepping away from the poem for a while and then coming back to it and just thinking, oh my God, that's just ridiculous. That's too much then, you know, because there were things in this poem that I had to take out, but I really pushed this one as far as I could go. And, you know, it, it's, this is one of the poems that sort of lends or where the, where the, as well as Sonnet 29, you know, the, the phrase like to the lark comes from Shakespeare's Sonnet 29. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's sort of, it, it, it's kind of flagging that this collection is about form and about music um, and uh, fun as well. Mm -hmm. You know, a lot, a lot of music is fun. So, I mean, do you think, um, a bit cheeky. Is this poem just swinging in the breeze? <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> but on, on a sort of more serious note, um, yeah. there are shifts in the poem between the almost drowsy domestic yep. and the, the external world, you know, shifts between um, personal intimacy and mm. The devastation beyond your know, references to Cyclone Tracy and oil spills in Mauritius. Yep. Um, are you are you making a statement in this poem about the relentless intrusion of the external world on our sort of tendency to be immersed in our own personal lives? Yeah, definitely. Um, and and that actually very consciously came to me when I was hanging out washing using blue pegs for blue things and <laughs> <laughs> but not long before that i had read about this uh oil spill from a japanese character uh, sorry japanese carrier uh in mauritius and so i was thinking uh about the home and the hills hoist as a symbol of the home and the homely and uh and the external world and something you know of uh you know far away from from where i am so and and the meeting of those of mm. those two words and what happens you know what does a poem look like if if we throw the inner world and the outer world together what happens when those worlds collide mm. um you know do we have a nice echoing of sound or does that you know do some people read that this poem and do the eels and the oyst sounds you know, do they really grate on them? You know, or do the does the idea of the personal and public is that also problematic for some people as well? Mm. Um, does it does it clash? Yeah, mm. yeah, we're thinking about. Um, all right, do you want to move on to a sestina? Sure, sure. Okay, so this is a poem I haven't read before. Um, it is a poem, I just want to say for people watching, it is a poem about rape, and it does discuss rape. Uh, it's called Sestina Rape. Sorry, uh, just going to get a bit more comfy. Uh, it's called Sestina Rape, and it's dedicated to Anita Cobby, to the memory of Anita Cobby. When I was a kid, it hid in our red crepe paper crowns, the scrape of fair knees, my mother's grape hyacinths. At eight, I watched it fly from behind a drape, the abduction, gang rape and murder of Anita Cobby. Nirvana's rape me, Tor Tori Amos me and a gun, white grapefruit. I was 18 when date rape donged, no such thing as male rape flared. No rape report, no rape kit. When I split the pith of this rape, three sweethearts laughed in my face. 
rape bird dogged me. The grapevine, the skyscrapered air, crepe myrtle, broom rape, crepe Suzette, red grapefruit. I squirmed at university, Zeus rape of leader, her nape caught in his bill, trapezius myalgia fanning out, the scrape of pear trees. Rape enclosure, my fourth sweetheart. Hard rape counselling. I forced down law and order SVU. Rape exposure after rape exposure. Finally, I stopped the king. Rape opiates, all stepped down. I cared for myself with rape. Brassiganapus. I devoured rape. I cleaned my teeth with the bones of rape. I was 40 when gang rape gonged. I was mellow as rape vinegar. I paired terror like grapefruit. Two beloveds denied my rape song. Seven repaired my red trapeze. It opened me like a window, this rape. Here, see its material drape. Rape declared nuclear war, but I am not rape torn or weary a rape trophy or poet. Rape, I've got my eye on you. Rape, prepare. Strike through rape. Thank you for sharing that with us, Stuart. Um, I know that, you know, some poems about traumatic subjects are very, very hard to write, let alone to read, and they need to gestate sometimes for years or even decades. Mm. How long did it take for this poem to come? Uh, about 23 years. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. It was it was after the it was after my second rape that I realized that uh, I responded to that rape in a very different way. Um, it's a very autobiographical poem and uh, responding to that violence in the way that I did made me realise that I could write about the first rape and the second rape uh, in a quiet way. Mm. Uh, and also in a way that, you know, I'd, I'd tried to write about the first rape many times and the poems are very angry and there was no sense of uh, transformation um, mm -hmm. or light or hope or happiness in those poems. And, you know, not every poem about rape has to have those in it, but I wanted mine to. Mm -hmm. um, and it took, yeah, it took 23 years and... Uh, I sort of knew one day that the time would be right. And and when it was, I wanted to write a Sestina where every uh, every end word was rape or a rhyme of um, to really to really drive home what I was writing about. And as I've written about elsewhere to um to be comfortable writing and saying that word that you know I used to hear on the radio or on the television and I would you know it'd bring me to my knees so um it was it was the most difficult poem I've written mm. it's the most rewarding poem I've written I haven't read the poem before because I've been uh, really concerned about how an audience might react or how they might feel about hearing that poem. Mm. Uh, but I realised there was a reason why I wrote that poem and that was again to not only uh, process my own experience but to um, well, there's very little writing in particular poetry out there about men who've written about their experiences of rape 
and uh, there are poems that I have read. Um, there's a chapbook by Dustin Brookshire, an American poet who was raped by a former boyfriend called uh, To the One Who Raped Me. And I was deeply moved when I read that chapbook. It was life altering. And uh, it was my wish in writing this poem that if one, one person read it and it, for want of a better word, helped them in mm. some way with their experience, then uh, I would be happy uh, having written the poem. And, you know, um, and quite a few people have actually contacted me, you know, through direct messages on across social media and said, you know, men have contacted me and said, you know, thanks for writing that. Um, you know, I went that through that, I went through that too, and it helped me. Um, now I don't, you know, um, there's, how do I say this? Um, there's no joy in hearing that somebody else has been through that experience or joy, uh, you know, joy is perhaps the wrong word. There's no joy in, um, it, it's, it, it's not a, it's not a, uh, I don't think, right, well, I've done my job. So, you know, uh, it, it's like any poem, it's a sharing of experience, hopefully a contribution to a discussion about a particular experience. Um, and if it resonates with someone else, then that's fantastic. Um, yeah. How did, it, how did it feel to read it? Uh, I felt really comfortable reading it, actually. I didn't think I would. <laughs> I thought about pulling the plug on this one <laughs> right, right up until we started this, yeah. uh, this, uh, this wonderful conversation, but yeah. I'm, I'm glad I did. Bravo. Thanks. What, what does it mean for you to have it out there now? Several things. I'm no longer afraid of what people think of me as a, I, I don't like the phrase victim survivor. I prefer to think of myself as a thriver beyond rape. Um, I've achieved a lot. I've achieved a lot of things that I thought I would never achieve. And, you know, uh, my first rape messed me up for a very long time, for 23 years. Uh, and, you know, but as I say in the poem, the second rape, uh, it opened a window. It opened a number of windows. I felt comfortable and confident and I hope that the poem I hope that the poem reaches people who might need to uh, read a poem that is in some way similar to their own experience uh, and that it might help them and by help them I mean perhaps it will change the way they think about their experience or uh, encourage them to make that call to a counsellor or go and see a psychologist. And that was the experience I had when I read Dustin Brookshire's To the One Who Raped Me uh, years ago. It, it, it gave me the green light to, to, write, to write about it and to write confidently about it and, and to kind of start thinking about putting poems about this topic out there and uh again like these like the early poems about rape that i uh that i wrote received some pretty uh harsh feedback from editors who felt that they could tell me exactly what they thought about uh writing about this particular topic um and you know now that's um it wasn't then, but it's water off a duck's back now. Mm. I, I'm very, um, I'm very determined to write about what I want to write about. I, I, I kind of, in a way, I don't really care what other people think, um, and I think that's for me that's really good. It may not be the case for other people, but for me, uh, with speaking about this poem in particular, um, 
doesn't bother me that people know. People have said to me, you know, like family members have said, you know, like, please don't include this poem in your book. You know, it's the sort of thing that you don't want out there. And I've said, why not? And nobody's been able to give me a, what I think is an acceptable reason to not include a poem about my experience of rape. But not just about my experience of rape, my experience of navigating that rape and how I um, transformed that rape and moved through it and beyond it. Um, mm. Because for me, for me, that's what what a poem about for me for me writing about that topic and about any other topic really has to be about. Uh, there has to be some sort of shift or turn or transformation, and hopefully, I've achieved that in that poem. Um, yeah, I mean, I I know that some people don't want to uh, read poems about rape, and that's okay. Mm. There are certain things that I don't want to read about as well and that's okay as well yeah. Um, yeah I don't feel angry I no longer feel angry I feel compassion for myself uh, I feel compassion for the people who raped me and that's been a um, a slow but uh, very rewarding process mm. yeah um, you've written it as a Sistina mm. um, which is, is kind of meeting the challenge of the subject matter of the challenge of the poet's form. <laughs> yes. Uh, how hard was it for you to get it to work in a Sistina format? Yeah, it, it was actually, uh, it, it was really difficult. Um, I, I mean, uh, uh, I start the poem with, it's, it's, so it's not until the fourth line that the word rape is actually clear as an end word. So it's hidden in crepe in the first line, scrape in the second, grape in the third, and drape yeah. in the fourth. So there's a sense of caution or... Uh, Just leading yourself there. Yeah, le leading myself there. And then, you know, really that that long line at eight, I watched it fly from behind a drape. Um, you know, I. There are a lot of Australians who remember, who will remember. Anita Cobby. Anita Cobby. And, uh, you know, it's very, um, yeah, terribly sad. Um, I also wanted to, you know, acknowledge what happened to Anita and also acknowledge, you know, Tori Amos' experience of rape and how Nirvana used the term rape to speak about their experience of the music industry. Uh, so, um, yeah, and and look, breaking lines at particular points was really important. No such thing as male rape and no rape report, no rape. And then have Kit on the next line. Um, you know, really this poem was, as I said, very autobiographical. Um, you know, when I when I told three sweethearts, they they did laugh in my face, and they one of them called me a liar, and that had a profound effect. I was thinking about how do I how do I put this into a poem? And in, I think the word rape actually appears because it's not just as an end word; it's elsewhere in the poem. Mm. I think it appears about fifty eight or fifty nine times. Mm. I think you know how do I how do I write this poem without people feeling like they're going to be, you know, overwhelmed? And, uh, you know, so I, I wanted there to be references to, you know, I wanted there to be cultural references. I wanted there to be references to, you know, things like fruit and things that we learn at university. You know, many people are familiar with, you know, um, the um, um, leader in the swan and you know law and order svu as well so mm. you know and, and commenting there that you know it's okay to have a television show about rape but you know like special victims unit that basically focuses on you know uh sexual violence but yeah i wanted to broaden the conversation and and try to try to do it gently in that sense it's you know it is a bit of a how to there's also a bit of 
you know, feeling as though I'd kind of taken, you know, when I say things like I devoured rape, I cleaned my teeth with the, with the bones of rape. I really felt like, and still feel like I had, you know, uh, overcome, kind of vanquished, mm. vanished that trauma. Um, so it, yeah, it, yeah. Was it always going to be a sistina? Did you did it start off as a sistina, or did it? It it did start off as a sistina uh, because I really um, my my main intention in writing this poem was to write the word rape out of me and be comfortable writing it, saying it, and hearing it. And I had exposed myself to that word over the years mm. uh, because if something you know, if uh, if a news report came on and it mentioned the word rape, I'd break down and leave the room. And mm. I thought, I, I, you know, I I can't go on living like this. Mm. I I can't continue hearing this word and and breaking down every time I do. So I, I thought I'm going to sit down and I'm going to uh, write a sestina about it, where every end word is going to be rape and the. Um, the poem that I read immediately before writing this was A.E. Stalling Sestina Like, uh, which itself is where, where uh, every end word is like or a rhyme of. Mm. Uh, and that itself is a nod to a poem by Jonah Winter called Sestina Bob, where every end word is Bob. Uh, and I, I just, I love that idea of really like, come on, you know, we're going to take this word on and we're going to see just what, what we can do with it, you know. And, you know, there's beauty in there, you know, like red crepe paper crowns and my mother's grape hyacinths. Mm. You know, like the word is in there, but it's also surrounded by by beauty. I don't mm. mean the act is beautiful. I don't mean the no, violence no. is beautiful. But, you know, there are moments of but I hope a beauty in that poem anyway. Um, yeah. So you appropriate the word, you take yep. away its power. Yep, absolutely. Yeah. So it would be stupid for me to ask you how many iterations of this poem there was before you got to the final one. <laughs> a lot, a lot. You didn't start at 23 years before you finished it, did you? No, no. <laughs> I started it several years ago, uh, and I, a, a lot of it did come out quite quickly. Uh, and then when I had this idea of a window, I wanted there to sort of be that 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 visual element mm. of the window. Um, yeah, yeah. All right, thank you. Uh, I'd like to read a, another poem for us. Sure. I'll just see what's next. Okay, uh, this one's called At Seven Mile Beach. Um, I referred to this poem earlier. Uh, so it's with a nod to Timothy Conningrave and um, the uh, the partner I was talking about earlier gave me a copy of Timothy Conningrave's Holding the Man. Uh, and those, those three words are the end words of this tritina. At Seven Mile Beach. At Seven Mile Beach, I walked between you and the sea, holding in one hand a piece of driftwood, in the other a loop of your blue jeans. A man studied us as if we were subhuman. God, I idolised your never holding back. Twenty-four years later, you packed the mourners in, but I couldn't control the body's salt and water. Superhuman holding off was my noted season. Holding on, holding on, yours live protein man yeah i i got totally hooked by that first stanza um there's so much so much is said in it without being said um there's a depth of feeling a whole relationship contained in that first stanza uh, the comfort of the physical proximity the sense of belonging and at the same time very cleverly the implication of drifting apart the the drift mm -hmm. of an ending. Yep. Uh, I'm I'm always interested in where poems emerge from. Yep. Because there's there's often there's often mystery in that process. 
did this poem emerge from the title or the opening image or Timothy Conagrave's book or somewhere else? Uh, it uh, actually uh, both simultaneously. Uh, so uh, around the time of writing um, uh, Sketching AIDS, I mm. was thinking of the same partner and a day that we spent at Seven Mile Beach. Um, it was a beautiful um, grey day, bit of drizzle at Seven Mile Beach in Tasmania. And uh, so I was thinking about that day and there were only three people on the beach, myself, my partner and uh, a homophobic man who started screaming at us. Mm. Um, and uh, then I remembered that that partner had given me a copy of of Timothy Coney Graves holding the man. And I thought, I want this to be a small, quiet poem about a large life. And uh, I thought, okay. Um, I had not long before then discovered the Tritina, which was created by uh, American poet Marie Ponceau and her colleague, Rosemary Dean. And uh, yeah, so it's a, it's a 10 line form uh, with uh, uh, Marie called it the uh, the square root of the sestina, and uh, which I love. And she wrote a lot of sestinas and villanelles and uh, pantoums and a lot of really terrific tritinas. And I thought, cool, well, you know, I'll give this one a go. So I had my end words holding the man. So the uh, remembering that day and remembering the gift of uh of holding the man and remembering that partner uh sort of all came to me around the same time and uh yeah i mean uh, you know i quite literally was walking between him and the sea um you know it's a very sort of it's a love poem it's actually very straightforward um i you know i wasn't able to be at uh, at his funeral you know i was in queensland but the funeral was in was in melbourne um yeah, and uh, yeah, so it was, it's quite a quite an accurate sketch of or an accurate portrait of of a day at the beach, but a very different kind of day at the beach. Yeah, um, and um, it's in the past tense, obviously. Mm -hmm. um, part memory, part reflection, a bit of nostalgia, a bit of love, affection, loss, all those things in it. A remembrance and a tribute um but it's also acknowledging particular attributes so mm -hmm. in the case of the narrator the holding off and the other person's holding on there's a there's a whole untold backstory in those couple of words really what do you want readers of the poem to take from that Sorry, I'm just. Oh. It's one of those. It's one of those less is more things, really. It is, and 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 a part of me wants to hold off. <laughs> well, you, don't, you don't have to. No, I'd 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 like to because there's um. There's. My holding off uh, was um. Was uh, anger was related to anger and not, you know. Uh, after we were no longer a couple, we were friends, but there was a reason why I was angry with uh, that partner for a very long time. And we eventually talked about it and, and resolved things, you know, it was over like that. But so my holding off was for many years, you know, this, mm, no, I don't have time to meet. No, I, I, I can't, I don't want to. And there's, you know, there's regret there you know when somebody's died you <laughs> you you can't you know you, you can talk to them in your head you can pray or whatever you do but yeah you you can't go back what i can do is write about him mm. and write about what i wish i'd done and what i wish i'd done was held on and in some ways, I wish that he'd held off a little because he was quite a, 
you know, he he never held back. He mm. didn't he didn't hold off. And his holding on refers to the number of, you know, the 20 plus years that he lived after his AIDS diagnosis, which is just incredible. It was astonishing. He went through a period of really um, you know, really intense depression and then thought, nope. I'm going to do this with my life and I'm going to do this, this and this. And he achieved these, you know, remarkable things. And, you know, like is, you know, lived perhaps the most um, rich life that I've ever observed and been lucky to be a part of. Mm. Um, and I'll always be grateful for that. But the poem is for me more, you know, more than tinged with sadness because I, you know, I, I can't go back and change things. Yeah, I would love to. So it's kind of a, a it comment to myself, and also maybe to the reader that you know, like, you know, uh, if there's something you want to do or say to someone, sorry, no, if there's something, not not something you want to do to someone. If there's something you want to say to someone, say it now, yeah. because may never get the chance to and that's you know when you've experienced that and experience that loss and that sort of regret it's it's a really powerful thing and mm. uh yeah realizing mm. that you can't change that so and that that had a profound effect on me and i thought the only way i can get through this is to I, the only way i can yeah get through this is to is to write yeah yeah um it's interesting the and probably not nothing to do with you or the poem, but the the last three words, holding the man, is a is a in Australian fo rules football. If you hold the man, you get a free kick because yep. they haven't got the ball. And so I was immediately directed there, even though it was probably completely unintentional in, in the poem. <laughs> um, so I mean, I quite like this form too. It's uh, it's got there's something about it uh and that's that repetition but also again the 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 concision and the precision required mm. Uh, mm. Uh, the compression uh, as well i really like yeah the compression and also in in the last so in the final line um the rule is to have the three end lines in order um some poets put them out of order so there's holding and then the the is hidden in live uh, yeah and then man is at the end yeah. uh, so some some poets you know remix that or you know do what i've do and have you know like a word buried you know one of the end words buried in another word um yeah but i i do like the smaller poem and i like the possibilities of 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 small forms and mm -hmm. uh you know that's sort of that you know, I've been thinking a lot about the ending of Plath's mush mushrooms, you know, we shall by morning inherit the earth, our foot's in the door, that whole, you know, the meek shall inherit the earth mm. sort of idea. And, uh, you know, I wonder if the little poems will inherit the earth. <laughs> well, I'm just, uh, I was surprised that there were no haiku in here. No, I've always struggled with haiku. <laughs> they're, they're a lot harder to write than they look, aren't they? <laughs> they um, are. <laughs> uh, so I have one more question that's not specifically related to this poem, but um, sure. this poem prompted for me. And it, that is, is part of the reason that you use so many different forms um, that you want to engage readers in different ways? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I mean, I do appreciate, uh, you know, an entire book of sonnets. I'm reading Anthony Joseph's uh, book. Um, I don't have it here. Oh, yes, I do. Um, sonnets for Albert, mm -hmm. which is about his father. I'm reading that at the moment. Um, uh, but but yes, I mean, I and it, 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 I had to think a lot about ordering this book, not only in terms of uh, mood, but also form. I mm -hmm. didn't want Sestina, then Sestina, then Sestina. Um, I sort of was conscious of not boring the reader with, oh, here we go, we turn the page and, you know, he's another bloody Sestina. Um, 
um yes yeah, so i i i uh I'm sort of contradicting myself here because I've just mentioned Anthony Joseph's book of sonnets, which I'm really loving. It's sonnet after sonnet, but I don't, you know, I, I didn't want to uh, arrange light to the lark in here's the bit on sonnets. Uh, sorry, here's the sonnet section. Here's the pantoum section. Here, here's the Sestina section. And there are, you know, there are, several conversations slash themes slash moods running through these poems and they had to have a particular order um and uh so then it was really sort of working out the order of that first and then managing and to f to fit in the different poems there mm -hmm. um but you know I'm, I'm very conscious of of readers and not wanting to uh make a reader yawn and <laughs> <laughs> you know um hopefully you know it, you know you 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 want to we want to we want to you know hold people's attention um mm -hmm. uh and also um yeah yeah i i i i think i do write uh, i i as I said, I read really broadly, and I think I do write as a reader also. So I'm thinking, well, how how would I like to to read this book? Um, mm. You know, so it's um, I think it's important when you're ordering a book to to try to get as much distance as you can and 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 be really objective about that ordering. Mm. All right, we've got two more poems. Better get on to the next one, which mm. is which is a a poem called Duplex, which is a duplex. Sure. Okay, so this is a duplex about emperor penguins. Duplex. Bone whiteness flowered among the ice overconfident. Eggs pouched, pear-shaped, were poached on our continent, pear-shaped. More chicks killed by the giant petrol spill than the southern giant petrol. More by the orange south polar skewer than the orange moored south polar skewer more adults by flip-top bottle seals than hulking, hotly flippered leopard seals. Shapeshifters evaporated flows. Shapeshifters ate evaporates flow sheets. Formless chorus, we sing the blues heat. Formless chorus, we sing the blues. Bone whiteness flowers among the ice. So this is one of, I think, eight poems in the book that are all titled duplex. Hmm. Um, that's the form they all employ. But why did you all title them all the same? Sure. Um, I suppose uh, just to honour uh, Jericho Brown, who invented the duplex, to draw the reader's attention to the fact that it is a duplex and that if people haven't, if readers hadn't heard of the duplex, they can Google it and you know, read about the form, which I think is quite fascinating. As I mentioned earlier, um, you know, Jericho Brown, in, uh, he invented this form when he had a really bad flu and he was thinking about gutting the sonnet, uh, but he's preserved the 14 lines of the sonnet. There's the uh, end word guzzle repetition, and there are elements of the blues poem in here as well. So uh, I love that that preservation of three or a sort of I love that three in oneness uh here um but yeah I, I simply wanted to call them duplex as a way of uh honoring um Jericho Brown's invention there I I think it's a really extraordinary form and I think it um yeah I I I uh I feel that a lot can be done with with the duplex and in the duplex. Yeah, well, it's my it's my new favorite form. Oh, great! I, I, I love your all of your duplex poems in this book. Um, I love the form. I love the execution of it. Um, I love the word play. I love the line play. <laughs> it's all happening. Um, when did you first come across Jericho Brown's use of the form and 
you know, come come to writing it yourself? I think a couple of years ago, um, I think there was a poem of his that I first, well, it was called Duplex at Poetry Foundation. Also in, he has several uh, in his book, The Tradition. Um, and yeah, so it would have been, yeah, around about a couple of years ago. Mm. Yeah. Um, and Jericho talked about, um, it's it's at Poetry Foundation. He talks about creating the form for a for a particular purpose to have those sort of blues poemy elements to it. But I I wondered um, most of the poems in here. I mean, so this Emperor Penguin Duplex, it, it's it's imagining a world where Emperor Penguins are extinct. And these are actually a ghost-like chorus of em emperor penguins mm. talking about what what mankind has, uh, you know, has done, um, uh, ha has done to our, our our planet. But I, I wondered if, um, you know, I, I look. I, I love plants, and uh, there were some plants in my garden at my last house that inspired a couple of these duplexes mm. uh, there's one about aloe uh one about the uh emu bush i thought oh i wonder if you know writing about those plants from their own point of view would work uh, in that form as well and it and yeah it, yeah i i hope it did um but i had a lot of fun trying to to make those work um yeah, I, as you said, you know, I, I agree. I love that there's um, there are so many possibilities for wordplay and pun uh, with the duplex because you have those those uh, echoes and those uh, the the doubling up of end words um, and also the repetitions within lines from one line to the next, but also there can be subtle changes as well. Yeah, well, you 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 work very hard on those subtle changes. I mean, there's a lot of subtle changes, and I, uh, and I I keep going back from from the previous line to look at the changes because I'm very intrigued by how you've done it, how you've how you've massaged the words into a different sort of way of, <laughs> um, and and not just the not just the words but the sounds, the sonic nature of the, you know, the, the when you read it, you can feel that sort of rhythm going through you. Um, it's fabulous, but what uh, what is it about the Emperor Penguin? Do you think that lends itself to this form? Mm, okay. Oh gosh. That's a bit of a tough question, David. Right, well, I'm going to help you out here. Now, you mentioned something in the notes at the back of the book about uh, these poems being, in some way, about resilience. Ah, yes. Yes, you're right. They are about resilience. And rather, this this particular poem is, e e even though uh, the, even though in the poem, the emperor penguin species is extinct, uh, the, the ghost, the ghostly chorus of the poem, sorry, the ghostly chorus of the penguins are, are still thriving and are still singing and still chorusing about what's happened to them mm. um and that's actually that that idea or that that concept of resilience is through all the duplexes uh in the collection perhaps most strongly in this um and i was thinking of the greek chorus um when i was writing this poem that's sort of how that last the phrase in sort of the second and third last lines came to me, formless chorus, we sing the blues. Um, you know, there's something about a formless chorus, you know, like the emperor penguins are gone, they're dead, they're extinct, but if they have formlessness, they're sort of everywhere at once. And I love this idea that, you know, the bone, the bone whiteness is, you know, mankind still flowering uh in, in 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 the antarctic in antarctica but 
um, whatever whatever mankind has, whatever humankind has thrown at these emperor penguins in the poem, you know, they they may have lost their lives, they may have been wiped out, but, you know, they're still singing their song and uh, are still, I believe, resilient. Um, so, you know, it's, it's, yeah, it's very much an awareness of what, what is happening to a number of species in the world and you know what what will certainly happen to some of them mm. and uh it's really a poem asking i suppose not so much what we can do maybe maybe it's a poem of resignation that this is going to happen to the emperor penguin mm. but but thinking you know like those uh That formlessness is in, its, is in itself a form, and uh, there's something magical about the number three and the duplex is a three-in-one poem. Um, it reminds me of a book from childhood that I was thinking about last night, the book of three. Um, yeah, and uh, so I love that. I love that. The concept that there can be formlessness within form and a sense of ongoingness and resilience. Mm. I I confess that I've tried to write a duplex since I've read yours. Uh, I failed miserably. It's a lot harder than it looks, isn't it? It really is. It's it's a really tough form. It it is. Yeah, yeah. Um, to to uh make those echoes work across lines um yeah it's it's really not easy um i think with any poem it's it's just for me anyway it's just a matter of continuing to write and write and write until it does work or you know maybe realizing that it, okay it's not working okay. Okay. yeah <laughs> I mean, how, how are you with that? Do you do you write and write and write, or do you then have a, a break, or do you come back to something? Uh, well, how I'm with things is different now to how I was with things before I had kids. So with right. three kids in my life, I get very little time, and so there's a lot of scraps of poem and not too many that get finished. Um, but I don't know that I've got now the patience to keep writing and rewriting and rewriting and rewriting until it gets gets there uh i think i'll i'll make a few attempts and then if that hasn't yielded a result i'll move on <laughs> as we must do to your next one well just quickly i look forward to reading your duplexes oh it's not a duplex uh, it turned into something else which is okay oh great and great and it not transformed a, it's, yeah it's not all a duplex i don't know what form it is but it's it's okay <laughs> great Okay, this one, this is the last poem. This is called Killing Bill or whatever the hell his name is, Battle Without Honour or Humanity. No one expected the second coming out, a burst rubber, a premature boom. Pep, you echoed. I'll drive you to the local clinic first thing in the morning. His speechlessness, a stun grenade, ignored calls, blast mines. Minutes later, grinders missiles. Small, the beef capital, the bit of linoleum on which Bill or whatever the hell his name is, fixes a gaze blank and pitiless as the sun in Cole's old-fashioned produce section. Your imagined visor blazes blackly like the bride's. Your Kawasaki sets off yellowly. I'm very interested, um, Stuart, in the the difference between how the poem reads and the way you read it and yep. how it's actually set out on the page. So visually, it's a poem that visually you need to you need to see to work out what's going on with the form, isn't it? It is. It is, yes. Uh, so it's a, it's a form I invented called the flashbang, which is an explosive device. Um, 
and uh, it's written in couplets uh, with a number of words in the first line and only one word in the second line of each couplet. And the first line in each couplet mirrors the arc of the thrown explosive device and the one word uh, mirrors the explosion of that device. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it was a poem that I wrote when I was incredibly angry. It's about a friend being outed on uh, Grinder, the Grinder app, as HIV positive uh, in a small town, and everybody then knowing that this person is HIV positive, and then encountering uh, that person uh, later in Coles where this person worked and uh, seeing his, you know, shame um, and recognition and what, at what he'd done. And uh, yeah, I, I mean, I, I feel angry, very angry now, just speaking about it. It's, uh, there are certain things about people that you don't share. Um, I have permission from the particular friend who I'm not going to name to talk about this poem and the experience and, and what's behind it. But I, uh, I needed, uh, I needed a poem that reflected the explosiveness of the situation and, and the, you know, the terrible messages that my friend received on Grindr mm. uh, and what happened in the aftermath. Mm. So um, the idea of detonation is obviously fundamental to the poem. Uh, to the form mm. and, and there's this the way that you've got this sort of the second line of each couplet being one word one word is sort of a suggestion of severance in the line breaks yeah. um, and the form generally something's always about to break yeah. um, but I'm just wondering does that limit its use possibly yeah I mean you can't you can't use this form for any any old thing can you no, no, and I mean, uh, if I, this this is the only um, flashbang I've written, and uh, there hasn't been another experience of anger that I've felt compelled to write about uh, as a flashbang. So I don't know how many of them I will write. But then again, you know, uh, I or someone else may find yeah. that the flashbang can be written about something, you know, about something that's not anger. Um, but no, no, no. I mean, this is really, this is what I find fascinating that, you know, form can be limiting. Um, and it, as, as I said, it may be the only one that I ever write. It may mm. be a, a one-off and, you know, that that's okay too. Um, you know, and then, you know, not, not every, not every word is, uh, not not every so, so the first line I call the flash and the second the bang, and not every bang is, you know, uh, has that sense of violence. Um, yeah. And the one of the one of the bang words is linoleum, which is quite innocuous. Um, yeah. Yeah. So you know. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. I mean, thanks for. Thanks for mentioning that. It's it's no no no. It's I find it really interesting that you know it it may be limiting. I may have limited myself to to just the one. That'll be unique. But, uh, <laughs> but how did you come up with? Uh, I suppose it's not that hard when you think about it in retrospect. But you know, flashbang the the, the name of the form. Yeah. Uh, so it's flashbang is a synonym of stun grenade which is mm. mentioned in the poem and mm. i just started reading about all sorts of uh um you know uh, explosive devices mines and stun grenades and missiles and i'm now probably on some government list <laughs> uh <laughs> Um, but it's it's 
yeah, so for this, the, the the form came first. I didn't actually have a name for it until it was actually published. And, and um, as I mentioned before, Felicity Plunkett, my editor, suggested that I write note, a, a note on form. And my publisher, Terry Ann, was uh, very encouraging, extremely encouraging of that as well. And uh, it was in doing that that I came up with a name for this particular form. Mm. Uh, I mean, I, I I know that there are other poems written with this form. Um, I just decided to give it a name and and to give it a a function. Mm. Yeah. Okay. Um, the title references Kill Bill, the the movie, uh, which yes. is spe spectacular for its violence, um, yes. and also, as you note, um, part of the soundtrack from the movie. Mm. What just can you tell us about? Um, the title and its relationship to the poem it's a long title it is a long title so uh the man that i'm talking about in the poem his name isn't bill um he can you know his his name is irrelevant like what, what i'm sort of getting at there is that the act Mm. The act of outing my friend is is what's what's important here. Um, there's I, I mean th these things happen and you don't know why, but as I was writing this poem, I just had that I just had a flash of that that scene where Uma Thurman's writing that kawasaki and kill bill alongside that car and then she just takes off on the the uh, she's wearing that yellow suit and she takes off on the kawasaki and and uh, and, and then i had a, a flash of um of of the song as well you know battle without honor or humanity and i thought this is perfect you know this this was a battle without honor or humanity yeah like there's no honor in this battle yeah, uh, there was no humanity here. This was cruel and unnecessary. And you know, like like my 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 friend did the right thing by telling this person that you know that he's actually positive and could go to the the clinic and get pep and and you know which is something you med medicine you can take uh, if you think or or know you've been exposed or potentially exposed to HIV, you know, it's sort of like a morning after pill for HIV. And, uh, you know, but there, there was no honour or, or humanity and there was no dignity. And I really got a sense of that when I, I was with my friend and we saw this person in Coles working and, you know, the as I mentioned before, like the look of shame on his face. And uh, I thought, I have to write about this. I have to try to, like, capture your 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 shame and you know the you know you know at, at first like as i say in the poem there was a gaze blank and pitiless as the sun and you know but after that like he was just hanging his head in shame not wanting to be seen by us and you know he almost i sort of could see him almost wanting to melt into the into the linoleum so as again it was just sort of that another kind of mysterious to me anyway, fusion of, you know, song and image that just kind of occur. And you think I I don't know why that has, but um I, I need to explore that. I need to sit down and and write it and 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 see what comes. And you know, I mean I, you know, I I love the I don't really love Tarantino. I really liked the Kill Bill films. Um but and uh Yeah, I I am interested in violence and you know, like is Uma Thurman's is the bride is she is she on a you know bloodthirsty quest for revenge or is it more than that? And that's what I wanted to get at in this poem as well. Um, is you know. I hope that readers would find that this poem ends with a similar sense of questioning, you know, like
is my friend about to set off and, you know, metaphorically kill that guy and other guys who know about his HIV status? Or, you know, is he going to do something else entirely? Um, you know, is it going to be a bloodbath, a metaphoric bloodbath, of course? Um, yeah, so I'm interested in violent acts, whether they're physically acts of physical violence or emotional violence and how people respond to that violence. Um, and this friend is a very gentle person, which is why it called for a, an ambiguous ending to the poem. Um, in fact, my, my anger at the situation was greater than his anger. Mm. Um, my outrage was greater than his. Um, and he has said as a person living with HIV that, you know, he's experienced it many times. So perhaps that's why that was a part of our conversation anyway. Mm. Yeah. So you say that the form has, in the first half of it, there's, the, the poem is split. Yes. But what you, what you call a bullet or a star yes. or whatever you want to call that. Yeah. The first, half yeah. Is, the first half presents the problem and the second half presents a solution if there is one or the resolution yep. if there is one. Yep. Um, so can you tell us a little bit about how the second half of this poem relates back to the first half? Yeah, sure. I mean, it's... Um... It more specific. It, it it draws us into uh, where we actually are, uh, mm -hmm. the beef capital, which is Rockhampton. Uh, whereas the, you know, the first half, we could be anywhere. This could be an experience that any man on Grinder has had. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm I'm, you know, uh, the specificity uh, in the second half. Um, I'm also uh, taking it out of uh, the online world of Grinder and bringing it into the real world of of Coles and a very rundown, sort of very dilapidated Coles as well. Mm -hmm. um, you know, in a in a small cattle town, um, but then. The there's a mirroring of um, color of black and yellow in uh, the second half that that brings us back um, uh, to the first half. There's so the Kawasaki sets off yellowly, and that's uh, mirroring. First, first thing in the morning, which is when, of course, the sun comes up. Mm. So the yellowness there, and also just the uh, the the imagined visor blazes blackly in the second half mirrors not only the blackness of uh, some explosive devices and uh, the color after explosion, but also the blackness of of the situation mm. itself. Uh, so there's sort of a, a kind of call and response element to the poem. Um, and also a, you know, the word name is in the second half as well. So it really stops being about a more ambiguous scenario and brings it down as I, as I mentioned before to a, a more specific one without actually giving away names or mm. um you know and and the the title as well whatever the hell his name is you know it's it's an it's an aggressive title and it re, it it refers very immediately and directly to the perpetrator of the violence in the poem but it also speaks more gently to other men who live with uh, HIV and to what they experience. I have a number of friends who are HIV positive and, you know, a number of them have had uh, very uh, difficult experiences mm. uh, around sexual and intimate relationships and their HIV status. So the poem 
it, it, it whatever the hell his name is isn't just vaguely or off the cuff referring to them but it's saying you know it, it the poem is in a way hopefully speaking to the experiences of of other people as well um certainly for me it's speaking to the experiences of other men i know living mm. with hiv aids um mm. and i think it's important that those things are are written about as important as as anything else mm. yeah and also of course probably the the last thing i've just on the, about that question that I sort of want to say about it is maybe you know the the danger of um, conflating the online world with the real world. Um, I've been having a bit of a break from you know sort of posting anything really on Twitter or Instagram for a while, and my God, it feels good. <laughs> you know, I've been going on there and liking a few things, but you know, it's just. It can just get a bit much, can't it? And I think we all feel that at times. And mm -hmm. you know, it's sort of a bit of a warning about getting so caught up in in the online world, whichever one that is, grinder, mm -hmm. you know, sex, sex app, dating site, whatever you want to call it, but also things like Instagram, Twitter, and you know, the, the kind of violence that comes from, yeah. from them as well. From the anonymous keyboard people back there just spouting out whatever they spout out. Absolutely, absolutely. Well, it's been a great pleasure. I've got more questions, but I'm not going to ask them because I think we've done our time well and truly. Uh, it's been <laughs> a great so. pleasure, Stuart. Thank you so much uh, for sharing poems and exploring insights on the theme of form and function. Uh, you've given me a new appreciation for form, which I very much thank you for. Um, Details of Stuart's books will be posted with this podcast, so please look out for them. We will return in a month or so with Rosanna Licari on the theme of nature, broadly with a small and capital N. See you then. Thank you, David. Thank you very much.